Dr. Greg Autry. Glad you're here. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Greg Autry is the clinical professor of the Space Leadership Policy and Business at Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State. It's a brand new program. We want to hear about that, sir. Thank you. He is an educator, a tech startup founder, researcher on entrepreneurship, commercial space, and economics. He's a former NASA presidential appointee, a writer, and regular Forbes contributor. And uh, I stole this off of your LinkedIn page because I thought it was cool. His goal improve the world by educating a new generation of bold and ethical entrepreneurs contribute to establishing a viable space economy for the benefit of humankind. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty badass goal there, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, please, let's, uh, let's hear from you, sir. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and first of all, I, I want to thank Andy for uh, everything he said, because now I don't have to. Um, but, uh, <laughs> he, he pretty well covered my shtick. So apologies if I duplicate any of that. I'm going to uh, share my slides here and, uh, and uh, pitch what I'm doing since uh, Andy had that moment. And I think this is a really actually important topic here. I want to talk about something called the uh, growing gap in space leadership uh, that I've identified that I know uh, Andy is aware of. Um, we've got what I call an astronomical need for talent. And you've probably seen uh, you know, a lot of cool data points like this, that the space economy, according to uh, the good folks at the Space Foundation, is $400 billion plus. And it always amazed me uh, when I was a professor at USC for seven years in the business school, they're trying to talk to them about uh, launching a dedicated space management program. And, you know, I just couldn't get traction. They saw that as a, as a niche, a teeny, some teeny little niche, right? And they wanted to talk about apps and cryptocurrencies and NFTs, right? You know, space is already so much friggin' bigger than all that stuff, uh, much of which is vaporware and I'm trying to think of the nice word, but we'll just say BS. Um, but, you know, they're just, there's a certain focus on that, that Silicon Valley mentality. And they, they totally miss the fact that everybody that's cool from Silicon Valley has been moving down to LA uh, to start commercial space companies like just a few miles from their institution. But anyway, I tried for years, couldn't get them to, to recognize this, this need for, for management leadership. Now, the good thing is that the government realized we need STEM, right? You know, and that's that's been a thing for for like a couple of decades that we've got to get back on track there. Uh, we saw what the Sputnik moment and the Apollo program did for our nation by forcing a lot of young people like me to go into technology because we thought we were going to go to the moon with uh, with Andy's dad, right? And when that didn't happen, we we launched software startups. Okay, I did that. Unfortunately, my software startup didn't make enough money for me to launch a a commercial space program, but I got to, to know people who did, and, and that was pretty cool. Now, space economy growth, um, you know, you're familiar with those projections, but I want to be clear that the crazy numbers from uh, Bank of America of $2.7 trillion by like 2040 in the space economy, you know, I want to be clear, that's the size of the entire UK economy. It's twice the size of the Russian economy, uh, but those aren't crazy numbers. That's like a linear projection of growth of where we are. The potential crazy numbers are are more like the size of the U.S. economy. Okay, we could be could be going there, right? Um, so the space sector is already four or five times bigger than the mobile app business that excites all my friends over at USC. Uh, the B of A projection again mild, um, but what's been missing? So we've got this uh, this understanding of aerospace engineering demand, and there's been all these articles for years about uh, how organizations are fighting for these engineers and Congress is going to do something about it, but uh, uh, we need management. Uh, one of the things that I've really noticed is watching all my friends from, uh, from NASA get sucked out of the agency into the, the commercial space sector for salaries that are way higher than even a, a, an SES uh, uh, salary. So, you know, most people in government service are unfortunately locked into the, the GS $1,330,000 a year salary. If you're lucky enough to get an SES position, you get like 185. Um, base executives right now uh, are, are being thrown for $500,000 with, with, with benefits. How do you get those jobs, right? Uh, how do you qualify for that? So there are very few people that are qualified both from a management experience or education standpoint 
and from an awareness of the space domain. So something needs to be done there. And Andy and I have been aware of this. We've been talking about it. We've been addressing it to some extent with the graduate certificate program we've been doing for three years uh, uh, with Florida Tech and ISU that I'm excited I'm leaving tomorrow for uh, for KSC and I'll, I'll see you there, Andy. Yep. Uh, to continue that, but we need, we need actually dedicated programs. Um, I am excited that uh, that students that I have worked with in the past have done amazing things. The guys at Relativity, Tim Ellis and, and Jordan Noon, who I had the pleasure of uh, of uh, advising off and on since uh, they were in the rocket lab at USC, have raised over a billion dollars. Right, a billion dollars for the B. That's amazing. Uh, as Andy noted, uh, some students from our last year online uh, class are literally going to uh, to the moon uh, with an astrobotics uh, launch that uh, that NASA is supporting. How, how cool is that, right? Um, so I, I think that I've had this opportunity to fix that. When I came out of not being NASA CFO, uh, which you know kind of sucks to get. Uh, 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 Blindsided by a hashtag 2020 politics that were uh, were nonsense. Uh, I had an opportunity. A lot of universities came to me and and were interested in, uh, you know, what what could be done uh, with space management. And that excited me to see that even though the Marshall School of Business at USC doesn't get it, uh, that uh, there were uh, there are universities around the world actually that do get are very excited about space management programs. So. Among the ones that came to me, uh, I was most excited really about the Thunderbird School of Global Management, ASU. Thunderbird has a long history uh, with the Air Force in particular, which I think really ties them uh, appropriately into space. They're globalized with uh, facilities in uh, Geneva, London. We just opened one in Dubai, um, uh, Moscow, Tokyo, Seoul. Uh, and we're excited that Thunderbird and ASU are opening a new facility in downtown LA, right in the center of the commercial space industry. It'll be the old Herald Examiner building in uh, Broadway and 11th. You know, that's like, I don't know, 10 miles from SpaceX and 20 miles from Rocket Lab and Virgin Orbit and Relativity and uh, Spin Launch and, uh, you know, everything that's exciting going on in that ecosystem. Uh, ASU also has this incredibly broad uh, uh, commitment to the space domain, so that excited me. Uh, and I thought we're getting back to the moon. We need to have the science. We need to have uh, the engineering. We need to have uh, the business. We need to understand the environmental impacts, the legal uh, impacts, and and they they've got that broad commitment. So I'm excited to be launching first executive master's program. Then we chose executive master's because we want to put butts in the seats uh, in January 2023. So we're launching in January. One year program, it's essentially the equivalent of a full master's in business uh, with finance and accounting, but for space dedicated courses and, and a space context and networking opportunity to that. So if you're in Silicon Valley or some other industry, you want to get into space, it's perfect for you. If you're an engineer in space, you want management creds, this is perfect for you. Uh, that's our goal. Uh, the faculty, I couldn't be more excited about. Uh, I won't pitch them all here, but go online and check it out or reach out to me and, and I'll connect you. Uh, as Andy noted, there are other programs emerging. I'm really excited about what he's doing at, at Embry-Riddle uh, worldwide, uh, you know, particularly for a, a full online uh, program, mostly asynchronous. That's going to provide some amazing opportunities. And we're going to still work together every summer at, uh, at KSC with uh, with both our students to uh, uh, to bring together that uh, in person experience and, and networking that's so exciting. Uh, definitely seen positive sounds coming from uh, from other uh, locations. It was interesting. The USC Policy School and the Engineering School get it, and they're coming together to put a, a certificate program someday. Maybe the business school there will get it. Um, anyway, that's what I had to say about that. And the other thing I wanted to share real quick, if I have a minute, is another project I'm working on uh, with my colleague, Phil Matzker. Um, let me see if I can share these slides. Battling technology, there we go. Okay, so Phil and I have been talking about uh, lunar landing pads and he is a, a subject matter expert from the, the engineering side. And we've had this economic discussion about that. And I just wanted to kind of review with folks why this is a necessary prerequisite to getting much farther than CLIPS, right? Uh, as Andy noted, I, I'm excited about where CLIPS is going. I've been working with uh, with CLIPS teams. I'm 
particularly thrilled uh, to see Mastin, who came out of Mojave and who have I spent uh, uh, years uh, watching, uh, you know, get uh, a contract for nearly $100 million to literally go to the moon, right? Um, and uh, having our team on the astrobotic ride is, is super special. Um, so you've got these bloom effects on the moon that we've known about, uh, you know, since Andy's dad went there, uh, you pick up uh, some dust, as, as they said, coming down, and, and you're uh, really kicking up the dust, right? You've got a super high speed uh, uh, exhaust plume coming out of this, uh, this vehicle. It is hitting this material and, and sending it forward at those super high speeds, uh, and there's no atmosphere to slow it down. Uh, so these, these bullets just keep going. Um, that's been documented and specifically was documented when Apollo 12 went and looked at the Surveyor 3 uh, 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 remote lander that had already been there on the lunar surface and saw what their landing uh, did to that the vehicle. They brought back some pieces of Surveyor 3 that were looked at. We were able to develop some models around that to understand what damage occurs. And basically for Artemis class uh, uh, landing missions, you're looking at like 50 times the, the damage that you got from, uh, from the surveyor uh, uh, damage. And basically anything uh, within 26 kilometers or so is, is, is going to have an issue. And that makes it really hard to land next to your, your lunar base, right? Or your scientific experiment. Or somebody else has a scientific experiment in the center of Shackleton Crater, makes it pretty hard to go there and get that water ice until you figure out what to do about this. So. Uh, one of the things to do is is cover the dust with the, with a physical landing pad, right? And that's probably going to be a, a requisite for any human-sized landers that are going to routinely go to the moon. Um, to do this, you're going to need site preparation. You're going to have to level the area. You're going to have to get rid of the big rocks. You're going to have to layer the gravel in kind of a, a macadam road uh, manner to make sure that the weight distribution works out the way you want. And then what do you do to seal the surface so you don't have dust? Uh, one of the popular ideas is, is centering to essentially melt in particular some of the iron that might be in the, uh, the lunar regolith in place uh, into uh, a hard material. Uh, you can do that with high powered microwaves. Uh, how do you power those microwaves? Becomes a big economic issue. So the solar power isn't free because you, you've got to put the solar panels up there. There's a cost in time in doing any of this that delays your program. And the, the time cost is, is a huge factor as Andy noted on the, these, uh, these programs where you've got a bunch of people sitting around waiting for things to be ready. You can bake pavers in an oven and you can distribute them. Uh, it turns out centering might be a little bit easier to automate than, than setting up ovens and moving material into ovens and moving bricks out and laying them, but there, there are advantages to both. Um, you can also spray plastic polymer and heat that in place into the soil and make kind of a, a, a composite plastic concrete. Uh, that works well, particularly in the outer pad where the, the plastic isn't uh, directly uh, hit by the heat of the uh, the rocket exhaust. So we're developing four different economic scenarios. Uh, I'm working in particular with Phil to work in the opportunity cost of, of delay on this program. What is the program worth, right? And what is the cost of every time you delay and the energy costs that drive uh, each of these solutions to help develop a uh, uh, an optimal uh, program. And it's the sort of combination of engineering and management that I think that, that needs to go into these things when we go commercial, because it's not going to just be government program forever where we can say, oh, it's a thousand times over budget like the, the space shuttle. And uh, that's okay, right? Because it's a cool national agenda. We're just going to eat that. That, that isn't going to work anymore. Um, and uh, it is time to start thinking economically. So with that said, I'd, I'd love to just engage with, uh, with Andy and whomever in conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, there was a lot in both of your, of your presentations. Uh, uh, I want to swing back to something that, that Andy said a minute ago. Uh, I've been, ref I, I personally, this is me speaking. I don't like the name new space. I think it, doesn't mean anything anymore. It was the phrase du jour 10, 15 years ago to describe the, the, the cowboy minority that was trying to commercialize space when there wasn't really a term for it. Uh, I think we've kind of gone past the usefulness for that phrase, but there isn't really a replacement 
language for that. Uh, Andy talks about risk in a couple different ways. I've been. <laughs> <laughs> that's my car. <laughs> Go on. Oh my God, that's epic. Uh, it's still wrong, but it's it's epic. <laughs> um, so I've been I've been kind of flirting with this idea that's not really fully formed, but that there's there's this spectrum of of risk space moving towards safe space, right? And I'm going to use the example of SpaceX. When they first started and they were still blowing up rockets, they were solidly in the risk space category, right? But as they get better at, as they get contracts, as they come in with Air Force contracts and eventually NASA contracts, they move out of the risky side and into the safe spot. Now, there are still elements that they're taking on internally. So it's a spectrum. There are, you know, uh, Starlink was solidly risk space uh, for a long time. Now it's got some government contracts from Canada. So it's a spectrum there. And then, you know, relativity, your friends, uh, Dr. Autry, they started in the risk space entirely, and uh, they still are mostly in that area, right? So is, you know, is new space a useful term anymore? And if it's not, which I don't think it is, what, what can replace it? Because trying to talk about commercial space doesn't really feel um, accurate anymore. Yeah. I have to say the worst thing about the phrase commercial space is that whenever I say it in a business school, they think I'm talking about developing strip malls, right? Absolutely so. right. I, I, yes, absolutely. I see. I, when I refer to, when I tell people I do space research, I actually use my finger and I point up because everybody thinks I'm doing real estate. But, you know, space people don't get because in the, our domain that works, just like they think crude space flight makes sense. But when I say crude spacecraft to the general public, they right. think, I mean, an unsophisticated, yeah. old, broken right. Um, right. spacecraft, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so our language doesn't make... fit what we're doing anymore. Yeah. Now, new space means nothing to them one yeah. way or the other. So yeah. they don't get it wrong because they don't know what it means. But, um, and... So I'm not, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to burn too many calories trying to figure out what we're going to call it. I'm, I'm more concerned with what ha what's happening. And, and Michael, you're, you're hitting on a really important point. And um, I, I think that um, Eric Berger's book is really, really instructive. Um, I would cast it a little bit differently. It's more of a learning process that SpaceX went through. Um, because what they were doing wasn't, I mean, it was risk space, but let's be honest, a lot of it was dumb space, okay? They were just making absolute rookie mistakes, um, but they learned fast. And in some ways, you know, what they're doing is coming from a, a, a place which says, if you, if, if you need to do something in terms of improving reliability, um, it has to buy its way in. And, and, and that's what's happened, but they've worked from a zero base to a place where they can still do a lot really quickly, but they've become a lot more like Boeing, ULA, whatever, than they were in the past. Right. It's a lot easier to do it from zero to where they are than where ULA is right now, trying to go from where they are, right. which is a whole lot of risk mitigation. And now you have to start peeling that away. And that's hard to do. Particularly, particularly when your customers are going to question each and every risk that you peel away. So, I mean, maybe that's a better way to talk about the process, but I think it's hugely important. And in, if, there, if there is something which really represents a paradigmatic shift, that's it right now. I mean, we talk about a paradigm shift being one where we go from a um, government financing government risk taking to commercial financing, commercial risk taking, commercial markets. Um, but I actually think the processes have undergone a greater change than, than, if you will, the top level economics of the industry. And I think the top level economics will probably follow that. But you know, to me, what's important is the processes. You guys, you guys can call it whatever you want to call it, but there is 
Um, it's, it's sort of Bob Dylan. There's something going on here and we don't know what it is, do we, Mr. Jones? Yeah. Well, so yeah, I'd like to see what, what the audience thinks about Andy's suggestion of dumb space, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I do think it's, it's really important because not what you don't know makes you powerful, right? So yeah, the SpaceX people, uh, and, and, and I have to recommend Eric Berger's book as well. It, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, um, that said, the SpaceX people didn't know what they couldn't do as much as they uh, uh, they didn't know what they could do. And uh, in, in the power in that is huge. And in, in any disrupted industry, uh, that, that's been the case. You know, that's how Apple got to where they were because Jobs and uh, Wozniak didn't know what they couldn't do. Uh, and it turned out they could do a lot of those things they couldn't do. So we've got to allow that and X space, maybe experimental space that it's that that nature of experimenting and, and, and risk taking that's that's super critical. I like uh, I like X space, um, experimental space. That's interesting. So when the markets kind of determine uh, you know, some winners, right? So your buddies again at relativity. Uh, most, I think all, I would say all of the SPACs that are coming online, they, every one of those folks have governmental contracts that stretch out years into the future and large governmental contracts, right? So nobody in this risky side is getting SPACs, right? They're not getting these uh, these market buyouts just yet. Uh, Momentus has, I don't know, a hundred million dollars on the books in, in, in booked revenue. That feels like it's not risky anymore at that point. Uh, I mean, I think what everybody in this whole field is doing is risky, but um, it doesn't feel like it's quite the same financial risk. Uh, well, but it is when you value is. the company at, at $4 billion. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we, we did an analysis of, of what the real serviceable market for small launch is. I'm going to pick on small launch because I just did the work. And, and it's really maybe 120, 100, 120-ish launches a year given what we know about future markets. That's not to say there wouldn't be, there aren't some events that could re result in a dramatic shift. If you take that market and yet, you know, make some reasonable, actually I'll, I'll make some unreasonable assumptions, like 35% profits and you do an NPV for the entire industry. Assume one company takes over the whole industry. It's a negative NPV. If, even if you're looking at 10% returns. Yeah. And so, Michael, yeah, I got to say, you know, you said succeed in the market or whatever about relative. I mean, there's the investment market and then there's the actual market. Now, the customer risk has been mitigated uh, when you've got government contracts, theoretically. But that doesn't mean that these companies are actually going to be able to deliver on those contracts. And I already know companies that have contracts in hand from NASA and DOD that are not going to deliver. I can tell you that. I, I won't give you any names. They're either going to be late very late or incapable of delivering on what they promised. Okay, this exists, right? That, that, that's out there. Um, and then when you look at Momentus, they've got political risk that goes way beyond uh, yep. the technical or the, uh, uh, the customer risk, right? And so there's a lot of different factors that all have to be combined, uh, which is why a broad management thinking is, is critical. You can't yes. just silo, silo this, look at it from engineering, look at it from finance or look at it from management or politics. It's and it, it's got to be accessible. And it's not just we need to have better managers. We do. Absolutely. Um, but we also need better people, better knowledge in the financial industry. I mean, it's it's not the manager's fault that they got valued at, at an astonishingly right. high. I mean, it will be the manager's fault if they squander the money. Right. But it's and I, and I worry about that. That's a different question. Um, we need to do a better job of educating the finance community. And, you know, we all talk to them and some of they, they either come in like two flavors. One is I really don't understand space. And so I'm just going to stay out. Or they say it's a rocket. <laughs> it's I want to buy it. Right. And, <laughs> and rockets, rockets are good. More rockets, more, more, more rockets. 150 and, um, rocket companies is, is a lot of rocket companies right now. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah but let me do you all a favor. Investors do not invest in any more rocket companies. <laughs> that said, 
uh, they want things they can go to a cocktail party and 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 and, and talk to the uh, the opposite sex about in a cool way, right? We did. Um, you know, we we had, we had <laughs> recreational investors at Moonex. I'll just yeah. say that. So let's focus back on the moon, right? Um, if 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 rockets are not the kind the the right investment right now, what what things are attractive about going to the moon? uh it's harder than going to leo it's more expensive it's uh there's maybe currently uh less things you can do there that have relevance back to earth so let's talk about the business of going to the moon because so far as far as i know no one's really figured that out yet i think there is a there there i mean i think um ULA makes a reasonable case. And I think there is, a, in general, a case that says propellant, if you can develop it on the moon at a certain price point and deliver it from the moon to anywhere in cislunar space, potentially could revolutionize space transportation, in space transportation. In fact, I think you could argue that the way we're really going to solve the Earth, the problem of launching from the Earth is by launching from the moon. So there, there is value at the moon. I'm, for the moment, at least, forget about the other resources and things like that. But rocket fuel, we know what to do with. We know there is a market for rocket fuel at a certain point. And cheap rocket fuel in space can enable a transportation system taking things from Leo to Geo and other places, which conceivably could make the business case for things like space-based solar power um, look a lot more attractive conceivably. So, I mean, I look at the moon as potentially being transformational. The problem is, the problem is path, it, there are so many things that have to happen to make it work, but there is a there there. But as far as, you know, you're talking decades. And so once you discount out the value of a dollar spent today, it's, it's, it's a tough business case without a lot of government participation. It's a tough business case. Uh because investors don't want to invest in things that aren't going to happen or deliver in their lifetime probably, right? And that, that's just the human nature. Now, the good thing though, is government participation is almost insured as long as we have Cold War 2.0 going on, uh, which is, is a huge benefit to us as it was a huge benefit back in the 60s uh, uh, for the Apollo program. So as long as the US government thinks that they've got a resource race going on on the moon and a, a territorial race, frankly, then, then you've got the opportunity to, uh, uh, to continue to have that anchor customer in place to get to the economic uh, uh, closure that, that Andy's well aware of. And, you know, just water on the moon as a propellant for electric propulsion systems in cislinar space is huge. If you make hydrogen and oxygen, that's, that's huge too. If we're really ever going anywhere past the moon, it's going to be necessary. Um, but you've got those asteroid cores sitting on the moon. Uh, there's probably plenty of metal. It's a lot easier to get it off the moon. Mm -hmm. It's a lot nicer place to extract it. It's a not, nicer, nicer place to do the manufacturing than strip mining, uh, say, the Amazon rainforest and, and setting up smelting here on Earth, right? So in the long run, I, I think we get that. There is a there there. Uh, it's just the time frame there there. That's uh, the question. And, and uh Unfortunately, we're not going to have a constitutional amendment that changes the nature of the United States government from this two and four year cycle. So that, ex <laughs> that, ex that external threat is is golden. So, you know, Chinese, Russian, moon base, perfect. I hope they add the Iranians and North Koreans soon. Um, <laughs> it's it's sad, but it's true. And it one of the things as a community we need to be thinking about is um, what do we do with it? I mean, it's, there is going to be a competition on the moon for precious little bits of, of property. And, and governments will spend a lot to do that. How do well, and ironically, sure my, my space friends in the community that love this Kumbaya cooperative sort of thing that we need to work with the trains, that'll actually just kill the program, right? It will go nowhere, nowhere fast uh, in, in that mode. Uh, the, the competition, as long as it's positive competition and not actual conflict, is is a beautiful thing and always has been. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But it, we we need to be aware of it as a community and ensure that the things that we do leave behind or create the infrastructure we need 
to do real lunar development. Uh, yeah, I'm I mean, super excited that the, the new appendix N that came out from NASA a few weeks ago used the word sustainable and sustainability all over over the language, which is critical because we don't have any vision past Artemis three, and we we need to get clarity there. Yeah, absolutely. we need more than we need more than language, right? We we had plenty of language in the Apollo era. It's well, so let's go into specifics, and we only have four minutes, so I just need some last thoughts on the CLIPS program. Andy, you kind of said, you know, you put it in a different spot on your diagram than I would have put it on. So I'm curious, uh, you know, let's talk about CLIPS in a little bit of detail. Where are we going with that? Is that a model that we can rely on for active development to the moon? And, and me too. I'm a big fan of Astrobotic. I've been watching them. I was a I was a two week employee for uh, a consulting contract for Astrobotic at the very beginning. So I always root for them. Uh, so what, what what are your thoughts on Clips? I kind of I mean I, I I think it's a good transition or transition program. I think it gets NASA cheap rides to the moon relatively cheap rides to the moon. So it's a good program. Long term, um, long term, it's not clear. I mean, at some point, at some point, you'll be able to buy rides to the moon the same way you buy launches. It's it, what we don't know is whether clips will will really develop that part of the industry. But I, I think there's a reasonable shot at it. Yeah. There are two futures in 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 uh, space. One where Starship uh, delivers what it promises and on time, and another one where it doesn't. And uh, you know that really changes everything long term. In the short term, Clips is a, a beautiful thing. I think there are actually closable business cases of uh, in the many hundreds of millions of dollars for Clips vendors uh, uh, in the short run. Uh, and these are surprising things like. Lunar sample return for jewelry, the the, the moon rock. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we talked we talked rent. about that at Moonex. Like you can sell that jewelry once. No, you can sell it more than once, but you can only sell maybe a hundred kilograms or so. But it's still hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, lunar burials pro proven uh, uh, demand there, and I don't think that ends. Um, so there are these interesting little business cases. But again, uh, if all of a sudden we're delivering hundreds of tons to the moon, uh, er er everything just changes, and so. We got to watch that play out. So, I would. Um, I would like just a, wait, 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 wait. That was like a movie scene, right? Yeah. yeah. You get, no you're comment. Both big, I, you're both if I told you how it was, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> exactly. You're both being a call at exactly the same moment, and and I'm not, so I'm like, wow, why are yeah? It's it's the. It's the rest so, um, Greg mentioned sustainability and the importance of that. I think. The major difference between today and Apollo is there's the potential for a sustainable presence, but a, the statement I'll make is we will have a sustainable presence on the moon when we make money on the moon, when we make enough money on the moon to, to justify the continued infrastructure. And once we get, we get there, we will be on the moon forever. If we do not get there, we will inevitably abandon whatever's on the moon because we're gonna go to Mars. The so, US government believes in sunk cost. If, and I, you know, all the way back to when I was on the uh, 2016 uh, transition team, was it put the stakes in the ground so that Congress can't back away from it. Put some friggin' hardware that you have to maintain. The ISS, beautiful example. Once you get that going, Ted Cruz or somebody will defend it until the end of time. Yep. Yep. Sure. Uh, last, sure. last question. Um, put on your, uh, your, your, your future hat here for a second. 2035. 2035, how many people will be living on the moon? Put a stake in the ground. I, I'll just tell you, I don't have a clue. I can tell you really? what the events are that would have to occur in 2030 that okay. would lead me to one direction or the other, but there's just so much uncertainty. I don't know. It's it's either 100. it's either a hundred or none. All right. So it's either a hundred, it's either a hundred or five. Okay. Okay. I like those answers. I can, I can live with those answers. Those are good. All right, gentlemen.